In an op-ed piece in today's New York Times entitled Kennedy's Finest Moment, Tufts University professor Peniel Joseph reminded us of this day, June 11th, 50 years ago. That day in history began with the intensely racist governor of Alabama, George Wallace, standing in the doorway of the University of Alabama to try to prevent the university's first two black students from registering. But the governor's defiance was crushed by a president who knew how to use federal power. President Kennedy nationalized the Alabama National Guard so that the governor had no control over them. The president had the students escorted by U.S. Marshals. And the governor was legally flattened at the door by Deputy United States Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach. I would ask you once again to responsibly step aside. And if you do not, I'm going to assure you that the orders of those courts will be enforced. The country was riveted by the confrontation in Alabama. I was just a little boy then, but I vividly remember seeing the governor standing in that doorway on TV and seeing him basically pushed aside by the power of the president, the president from Boston, my Boston. But I didn't remember the rest of what happened that day until it was pointed out today in Professor Joseph's op-ed piece. Good evening. This is Chad Huntley reporting. Tonight, integration showdown, the Alabama story. After the personal role the President of the United States had played in today's drama at the University of Alabama, it seemed only natural that he should go before the American people and tell them the why of it. The President did not limit himself to discrimination problems in the South. He hit broadside at discrimination everywhere in the country and spoke of it as a moral issue. Professor Joseph, who is the author of Dark Days, Bright Nights, From Black Power to Barack Obama, calls that speech on this day, 50 years ago, Kennedy's finest moment. I remembered that speech when I watched it again today, and I remembered that the president was telling us in Boston to not start feeling superior to the white men standing in doorways in the South because the plague of racism was everywhere in this country. And as clear as that seems now, nothing like that had been said to the American people, to all of the American people by their president. The president was echoing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in a way that would have seemed radical just a short time earlier and surely did seem radical to many Americans on June 11th, 1963, possibly even most Americans. Here is some of that speech made that made many white Americans stop and think for the very first time about what their president was telling them for the first time was a moral issue. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This afternoon, following a series of threats and defiant statements, the presence of Alabama National Guardsmen was required on the University of Alabama to carry out the final and unequivocal order of the United States District Court of the Northern District of Alabama. That order called for the admission of two clearly qualified young Alabama residents who happened to have been born Negro. That they were admitted peacefully on the campus is due in good measure to the conduct of the students of the University of Alabama who met uh, their responsibilities in a uh, constructive way. I hope that every American, regardless of where he lives, will stop and examine his conscience about this and other related incidents. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. Today we are committed to a worldwide struggle to promote and protect the rights of all who wish to be free. And when Americans are sent to Vietnam or West Berlin, We do not ask for whites only. It ought to be possible, therefore, for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. It ought to be possible for American consumers of any color 
to receive equal service in places of public accommodation, such as hotels and restaurants and theaters and retail stores, without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street. And it ought to be possible for American citizens of any color to register and to vote in a free election without interference or fear of reprisal. It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, as one would wish uh, his children to be treated. But this is not the case. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. This is one country. It has become one country because all of us and all the people who came here had an equal chance to develop their talents. We cannot say to 10% of the population that you can't have that right, that your children can't have the chance to develop whatever talents they have, that the only way that they are going to get their rights is to go in the street and demonstrate. I think we owe them and we owe ourselves a better country than that. Therefore, I'm asking for your help in making it easier for us to move ahead and to provide the kind of equality of treatment which we would want ourselves, to give a chance for every child to be educated to the limit of his talents. As I've said before, not every child has an equal talent or an equal ability or equal motivation, but they should have the equal right to develop their talent and their ability and their motivation to make something of themselves. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible, will uphold the law, but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair, that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we're talking about. And this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. And in meeting it, I ask the support of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. That was a Friday. The weekend newspapers, especially the Sunday newspapers, would have been flooded with coverage of the president's speech. But coverage of the speech was overwhelmed by what happened a little after midnight that night in Jackson, Mississippi. A white racist assassinated civil rights leader, Medgar Evers. I remember hearing about the Medgar Evers assassination the next morning and feeling that sensation of one step forward and two steps back that the civil rights movement suffered for so long. The first black students registered at the University of Alabama in the morning and Medgar Evers assassinated that night. Also, that night in Boston, the chairwoman of the Boston School Committee, Louise Day Hicks, was publicly confronted for the first time by the Boston chapter of the NAACP. And so was set in motion a battle over the desegregation of the Boston public schools in the president's hometown that Jack Kennedy would not live to see resolved. But we do know whose side Jack Kennedy would have been on. I want to pay tribute to those citizens north and south who've been working in their communities 
to make life better for all. They are acting not out of a sense of legal duty, but out of a sense of human decency. Like our soldiers and sailors in all parts of the world, they are meeting freedom's challenge on the firing line, and I salute them for their honor and their courage.